These are notes on patterns of inheritance, and in your book it's pages 495, 496 to 497, and pages 510. These notes will help kind of formalize what you've already been thinking about in class as far as what genotypes and phenotypes get passed on through generations. So I want to go with a brief overview of how genes are inherited. Some of this you already know, some of this you've kind of figured out, um, but I think it's good that we look at all of it just one quick time. So remember that every individual has two copies of each gene, and one gene comes from the mother through the egg, and the other gene comes from the father through the sperm. And we've talked about this in class, but I'm going to say it one more time, that when we're talking about mother and father, in this case, we're talking about biological mother and biological father. So that may or may not be who your actual family is. So family are the people you live with, the people you may call mom or dad, uh, which may or may not be genetically related to you. And so regardless of who you live with, someone out there gave genetic material through an egg and someone out there gave genetic material through a sperm. And um, I'm going to do my best to keep saying like biological or genetic, but just know that if I say mother and you're like, but I don't live with my genetic mother, totally know that um, and that does not mean that your family is any less uh, just because the genetics may be coming from somebody else. All right so in the case where both parents are homozygous dominant it's pretty obvious hopefully at this point you know that the child would be homozygous dominant and the same goes if both the parents are homozygous recessive then the child is going to be homozygous recessive. But where it starts to get interesting is um, when the parents have different genotypes or even if one of those genotypes is heterozygous. So if the parents have different genotypes, like the uh, biological mother is homozygous dominant and the biological father is heterozygous, then the child could be homozygous dominant or heterozygous. And in fact, as we talked about in class when we were looking at PTC tasting, I think it was PTC tasting, um, the child would have a 50-50 chance of either genotype. And yet, because um, big F is dominant, they would actually have the same phenotype as both of their parents. So these parents would have the same phenotype even though they have different genotypes. So what I want to show you is something called a Punnett square, which is a way of determining likelihood of genotype. So a lot of you have already figured this out just, um, just logically, but now I'm going to give you a formal way to figure it out. And you'll hear some people call Punnett squares um, sperm egg charts, and part of that is to get away from this idea or to separate this idea of biology from family. Um, but we're going to call them Punnett squares because that's what you're going to run into as you go through higher level courses in biology and, and certainly in college. So what we're going to do is we're going to draw a two by two square and we're going to put the mother or the egg genes on the top and the father or the sperm genes on the side. And it doesn't matter, you can swap those it, because the, the zygote, the um, cell that is then the combination of sperm and egg doesn't actually know which genes came through the egg and which ones came through the sperm. So let's look first at that case where the egg has, or I'm sorry, where the biological mother is homozygous dominant, meaning all eggs are going to carry the capital F um, gene allele, the dominant allele. But remember, the father was heterozygous, meaning half of his sperm is going to carry the dominant allele and half is going to carry the recessive allele. And so we kind of divide it up like this, as you can see. Now we treat this like a multiplication table. So we're going to bring this big F down to here and then down to here, this big F across to here and across to here, this big F down and down, and this little F across and across. So we get something that looks like this. And so you can see, right, this becomes big F, big F, because this big F came down and this big F came across. 
this becomes big F little f because this big F came down and this little f came across and so forth. And these squares in the middle are possibility of offspring. Now there are technically four offspring here. That doesn't mean this couple would have four children, obviously, but this gives us a likelihood of um, genotype and phenotype for offspring. So you can see down here, um, these would be heterozygous, these would be homozygous dominant, which means this child any, any child this couple has has a 50% chance of being homozygous dominant and a 50% chance of being heterozygous and yet a 100% chance of having the dominant phenotype because um, in, in both cases this child carries the dominant allele. Um, so this also doesn't mean just when we're talking about probability that if the couple has two children one would be homozygous dominant and one would be heterozygous. They could both be homozygous dominant because every time this couple has a child it's a 50-50 chance of each genotype. So if you're a math person you can probably figure out so that means if there are two children there's a 25 percent chance of them both being homozygous dominant or both being heterozygous. So let's now take a case where we have both parents being heterozygous. So I want you to pause the video and then go through and calculate the um, proportion of both genotypes and phenotypes in this offspring. So go ahead and pause the video right now. Okay, so if you didn't really know how to get started, then if these are both heterozygous, you would set your Punnett square up like this, where half of the eggs have the dominant allele and half have the recessive allele, half the sperm have the dominant allele and half have the recessive allele. So if you didn't actually get any further, now pause it again, hopefully this will be able to prompt you, and then we'll come back and see the answers. So in this section, right, this potential offspring would be homozygous dominant from this capital F and this capital F. This would be heterozygous from this capital F and this lowercase f. This would be heterozygous. This would be homozygous recessive. And so we see this then would be our homozygous dominant case with a dominant phenotype. These two would be heterozygous with a dominant phenotype, and then this one is homozygous recessive with a recessive phenotype. So we can see there would be a 25% chance of homozygous dominant, a 50% chance of heterozygous, and a 25% chance of homozygous recessive, but a 75% chance of showing the dominant phenotype and a 25% chance of showing the recessive phenotype which is how you can have a child who shows a trait that neither parent shows. Because if both parents are heterozygous, then the child could have inherited both of those recessive alleles and they could be homozygous recessive. So now I want to show you some cases um, of dominance in a heterozygous a heterozygous example that is not as simple as showing the dominant allele. So the first kind is incomplete dominance. In this case the alleles are combined into a blended phenotype and as I said this really only matters in the heterozygote because for example these are snapdragons. Um, snapdragons happen to show incomplete dominance. You wouldn't know that if somebody didn't tell you so you don't have to worry about like how would I know that that's incomplete dominance um, although given enough information you should be able to figure it out so if you have a red flower that would be homozygous dominant and a white flower that would be homozygous recessive instead of, when these cross or mate pollen remember is flower sperm you get all heterozygotes and Normally we would say these would all be red, but in fact in snapdragons we see that they're all pink. That's what's called incomplete dominance, where the heterozygous example 
is blending into a new phenotype that is a combination of the two phenotypes of the parents. Obviously, if both parents were homozygous dominant, you would get red snapdragons. And if both parents are homozygous recessive, you'd get white snapdragons. But in this case, where you have homozygous dominant and homozygous recessive, the result is pink snapdragons. That's incomplete dominance. I want to show you a cell model example using some things we've used in class. So here we have cystic fibrosis, which is simple dominance, and we talked about that in the uh, genetics vocab notes. And if you remember, in the homozygous dominant situation, we're making all functional protein channels. In the heterozygous example here, we're making half functioning protein channels and half lightning bolt non-functional channels. And my apologies to those of you who are finding it hard to draw lightning bolts. Um, and what we realized, though, is if there's any functioning protein channels, then the person does not show the symptoms of cystic fibrosis. So we'd say that it's just simple dominance with one allele making functioning um, protein channels. We don't have cystic fibrosis, which is the exact same phenotype as the homozygous dominant cell right here, even though the genotypes are different. But here's an example that we see um, where that is not the case, where the heterozygote has um, neither the phenotype of the, um, of the recessive alleles nor the dominant alleles. And so looking at hair texture, we talk about hair texture, we have curly, wavy, and straight. And there are variations within that because there are other genes that control for like hair thickness, for example, which can then affect like what kind of curls you have. But the wavy, curly, and straight, or straight, wavy, and curly has to do with the hair follicle opening. And if you look online at different hair follicles, you see that opening has to do with kind of how the follicle is shaped going into the skull. I don't know that you need that much depth, but know that the opening then affects how the hair grows. So if you are homozygous recessive over here, you have a nice circular hair follicle opening and that causes straight hair to grow. If you have a really kind of elongated hair follicle opening, then that would be from a homozygous dominant situation, you get the phenotype of curly hair. Where it gets interesting is if you are heterozygous. So you have one allele that would be making proteins for this kind of elongated follicle. Um, and then you have one allele that would be making proteins for this circular follicle. And what you get is kind of a, an in-between. It's not circular and it's not elongated. It's kind of a in-between. And what you end up getting is an in-between phenotype, which is where we get the wavy hair. And so this is a really good example of incomplete dominance in humans. And now you can also compare it to the simple dominance in the cystic fibrosis. Another kind of dominance where in the heterozygote you see a different phenotype than what we would expect in simple dominance is codominance. In this case, the alleles are both expressed. So this isn't a blending. It would be as if in hair texture, if you are heterozygous, some of your hairs grew straight and some of them grew curly. Now that's not what we see, so we can reason that hair texture is not co-dominant, but it's incomplete dominance. And that's where I was saying, like with the snapdragons, you might not know that, but given some background information, you should be able to predict whether something is simple dominance, co-dominance, or incomplete dominance. So some examples of co-dominance are camellia flowers. So unlike snapdragons, if you breed a white camellia and a red camellia, you actually get a red and white camellia. And again, somebody would have to tell you that. There's no way you would know that like camellias exhibit co-dominance and snapdragons exhibit incomplete dominance. Um, there are 
kinds of horses called roan horses. And so a roan horse is where you get a chestnut horse and a white horse. And at first glance, this looks like it would be in complete dominance. But if you actually look at the hairs, you notice that some of the hairs, in fact, are white and some of the hairs are brown. And our eyes, because there's so many hairs, kind of blend that into a tan color. Um, but that is, unlike the hair texture, there are actually white hairs and brown hairs and we see kind of a blending. And then where we see it in humans is we see it in blood types. And so um, if you have somebody who is type A blood and somebody who's type B blood, they can have um, a child who is AB, so has the A allele and the B allele. And so that is type AB. And I'm going to show you on the next slide what that means. But there's actually three alleles here, the A allele and the B allele, and those are codominant. And then the O allele is recessive, meaning the only way you can get the O blood type is if you have two O alleles. So in these parents here, they both have one O allele. Neither one has O blood type. And it's not called like type BO or AO. It's just type A and it's just type B. Um, and so you can kind of see how you could set up a Punnett square to show this. But then it's also showing right here are four offspring. Four because it would be an A and an O and a B and an O. Okay, and so now I'm going to show you what that actually means on the surface of cells. Okay, so if we're looking at the three types of blood, or, or the three alleles, A, B, and O, um, what we're really looking at are these proteins that are on the surface of the blood cell. And so we know that blood cells are mostly hemoglobin, and we've actually studied a lot of hemoglobin, but there are these proteins on the surface called antigens. Um, and antigens give the blood, uh, we'll just say some kind of character. So type A blood has A antigens. So we're going to represent that by these little triangles. Type B blood has these circle antigens. And what that means about A and B is that type A blood has A antigens, but then the body makes what are called B antibodies. So antibodies are different compounds that will attack foreign items in the body. Okay? So if somebody with type A blood gets type B blood in them, like through a blood transfusion, if they're in an accident, the B antibodies will actually attack the B blood cells. It'll, they'll recognize these little antigens as foreign. They'll attack the B blood cells, and that can actually, I mean, it, it can kill a person at, at an extreme. Um, and so that's why this then becomes important. But what's interesting is the type AB blood cell has both the A antigens and the B antigens on it, okay? which means that type AB could receive a donation of type B blood or type A blood and be fine, because either way, it'll recognize those antigens as um, friendly. Type O blood, the recessive one, doesn't make any antigens at all, which means type O is what's called a universal donor because since there's no antigens, you could donate that type O blood to any of the blood types. But on the flip side, type O blood can only receive donations from other type O blood. But that shows you kind of from a protein model what's going on with this codominance um, phenotype. And so those ideas of codominance and incomplete dominance become really important when we're starting to look at traits overall because so many of them exhibit something other than simple dominance. All right, please feel free to add questions to the comments section on YouTube and have a good night.